Well, it is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Congresswoman Jane Harmon. Congresswoman represents the 36th district of the great state of California. She was first elected in 1992. Uh, she took some time out in 98 to run for governor. Uh, her constituents then returned her to uh, district representation in the next election, and she was in the Congress during the tragic events of September 11th and has, prior to and especially after that incident, become one of the leading voices of reason and experience uh, on the issues of international terrorism, things that have concerned her for a long time uh, uh, prior to uh, the events of September 11th. Her, her uh, congressional quarterly profile uh, says that one might argue that she's better prepared for these responsibilities uh, because of her hiatus uh, in uh, 99 and 2000. And what they're referring to is that during that period of time, she was uh, one of the 10 members of the congressionally mandated National Council on Terrorism, which issued its report in the year 2000, and among other things, um, offered the observation that, quote, today's terrorists seek to inflict mass casualties, close quote. So she has been uh, on this subject uh, for uh, her entire congressional uh, career and has, as I say, become one of the leading voices of reason and experience on it. She also, I must mention, since environmental law is one of my other interests, has a very active uh, interest and engagement in environmental issues and uh, in particular in uh, clean fuel and alternative fuel technologies where perhaps the intersection of energy security uh, and her international terrorism interest can be evident since solving some of our oil dependency problems would uh, be a significant advantage to the security interests of the country. So it is a, a distinct honor and privilege, as I say, to introduce her uh, to give the keynote address today. Please help me in welcoming Congresswoman Harmon. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, thank you, Scott Stillman, who has been, uh, Silliman, who has been uh, uh, a, a very um, respected advisor to many of us on, uh, on the issues of, uh, I, I would say, unrestrained use of executive authority. And uh, hello to Warren Wickersham. Where's Warren? Uh, there he is, uh, a dear friend from, from another era. Uh, we practice law together. Uh, and um, hello to some very smart people from this uh, community who are very interested in trying to figure out better solutions to tough, tough problems. Uh, I only wish I was saying this to uh, Chris as we were chatting, that more people in Congress wanted to figure out solutions to very, very tough problems. I, I think there's too much time spent pointing fingers and not enough time spent uh, really uh, wrestling to the ground uh, the hardest issues. Um, I often say we've, we've solved all the easy problems. Uh, everything that's left on the table is hard. And thinking through the hard answers and building the political will uh, to support those solutions is uh, something that a lot of people just just don't want to do anymore. So I also appreciate the comment about uh, the environment. There is an intersection, no question about that. Uh, and uh, I think weaning ourselves from dependence on Middle Eastern oil is a very big piece of a longer term solution to uh, the, the very difficult intractable security issues that we face. Uh, so I do spend time on that. And coming from Southern California where um, most people drive solo in um, uh, inefficient cars on these glutted freeways. Uh, the lesson comes home. We can surely do better. At any rate, uh, I have spent, as you heard, my congressional career at the intersection of law and national security. Uh, early in my career, a thousand years ago, I, I served as staff director uh, of the Senate uh, Judiciary Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights. Uh, during the Carter administration, I first worked in the Carter White House and then as special counsel to the Department of Defense. Uh, I spent many years in law practice uh, before announcing to my astonished family in, at, at middle age uh, that uh, I wanted to run for the United States Congress. 
Um, all of their arguments to talk me out of it failed, and I actually did it. Uh, my first run for public office uh, beyond, uh, after, well, my second run. The first run was for uh, junior high school treasurer, which I lost. <laughs> and, and a few years later, I ran for the United States Congress and did win and had some very tough elections in the 90s. Actually, in, in 94, my first re-election, um, I was elected uh, by 812 votes out of 225,000. Uh, you really ought to, uh, ought to try that experience. And that wasn't even until two weeks after the election. I was down 225 on election night. And I won in the, after they counted the late absentee ballots. And then my opponent, who had already gone to Washington to announce that uh, she was running for uh, freshman class president, um, challenged the race under something called the Federal Contest of Elections Act, claiming that uh, my, uh, my votes um, or the, my margin of victory came from votes by undocumented workers. Um, that was a, a ploy that failed ultimately, but it took nine months until that case was dismissed. So it was pretty brutal. I, I don't recommend that. It's not for the faint-hearted. At any rate, um, I came to Congress in uh, early 93 called the Year of the Woman. Anyone remember that? Uh, we, we had doubled the number of women in the, in the House. Uh, possibly unique among my classmates because I said my focus will really be it, uh, primarily on national security issues. I, I was first named to the Armed Services and Science Committees and then I uh, gave up science for uh, intelligence and then I uh, gave up armed services for homeland security. So over the years, I've had a, uh, a real immersion in security issues. Uh, part of that has to do with uh, long, my long time interest in those issues, but part of it also is that my district in uh, Los Angeles, along the coast, just south of Santa Monica, is uh, Aerospace Central for California, and aerospace is a bigger uh, um, uh, uh, economic sector in California than agriculture. People don't understand that, but it is a, uh, a huge part of the California economy. My district is where most of our intelligence satellites are made, and I'm very proud of the work that our, our aerospace community does, and I'm very supportive of it. And I've spent years and years trying to learn the programs and trying to help uh, transition uh, what I have viewed as an archaic uh, intelligence structure to something much more suited to meeting 21st century threats. Well, at any rate, here I am as ranking member on the House Intelligence Committee. I have been in that position for uh, two and a half years. Uh, it's, an, it's a great opportunity, uh, at least opportunity, to uh, speak to the hard issues. Uh, I actually even had a great opportunity last fall to solve one of the hard issues, and that was the uh, restructuring of the intelligence community. I was one of what was called the big four. Those were the four uh, conferees, two in the House, two in the Senate, bipartisan, two out of four women, no wonder we did well, um, at any rate, who uh, figured out a, a compromise on the intelligence reform bills passed by the House and Senate, and, and President Bush signed it into law a few months ago, and. I doubt you missed it. Uh, the WMD Commission last week wrote a brilliant report, in my view, an absolutely brilliant report on uh, many of the problems uh, plaguing our intelligence uh, products. And uh, part of the 72 recommendations of that report are very useful ideas for making the DNI structure work. And so something I'm planning to do uh, in this Congress, it's not what I'm talking about today, but I'll answer questions about it if you wish is to work with John Negroponte, whom I saw this week, and Mike Hayden, whom I saw yesterday, uh, and the um, WMD commissioners, most of whom I've known in a long lifetime, probably many of you know them too, uh, to make sure that that legislative uh, idea uh, becomes effective. I think there's about a six-month window, and if we don't get it put together right, and Negroponte and Hayden don't win the major turf fights that will come very fast. Uh, no one would miss where they will come from. Uh, if they don't win them, I, I think uh, we'll, they'll fail. And it's not just about them, um, although it's not fun to fail. Uh, it's really about whether or not we're going to be able to field an intelligence capability uh, that will understand uh, and uh, uh, 
prevent and disrupt the threats against us. Uh, it's obviously better to do that than to respond, and uh, that's where my head is and uh, where I think we need to go. At any rate, I want to talk today about a subset of issues that relate to uh, getting and fielding intelligence, and, and they relate to detention and interrogation policies, nice, easy issues. I know you've been talking about them for two days. Um, many of the people who've been here have thought about them in a lot more depth than I have, uh, so I'm a little embarrassed, I think, um, because I guess I have other things to do, and the perch I have is not one that lends itself to the kind of scholarship that that uh, those of you here uh, um, are, are able to do. Both uh, Scott and Chris and others here, I, I think, uh, um, can eat my lunch on, on, the, on some of the, the technical aspects of these things. But that's a good thing. That's why I'm here. Uh, that's why I want to uh, work with all of you. And I also want to mention that Jeremy Bash is right there. Jeremy Bash is very smart. He is the general counsel to the minority side of the House Intelligence Committee. Um, and. Uh, he has worked with me on a lot of this, so if you ask me a hard question, um, Jeremy will answer it. At any rate, um, the major role of the House Intelligence Committee, in my view, is oversight to ensure not just that uh, taxpayer dollars are spent wisely, but also that the activities of our intelligence agencies are legal, consistent with our policy objectives, and consistent with our values. Because so much of what we do is in secret, I think our oversight must be all the more aggressive. So today, let me just make three points about that and then take questions. I really think that that's a better use of your time uh, than to just uh, lecture you. Uh, first point, and I gather this came up yesterday, uh, both in the evening uh, speech by the uh, Egyptian ambassador and some earlier comments by Jim Pavitt. Um, Calling uh, what, what we're involved in a war on terrorism, I think, is a misnomer. Uh, we really are living in an era of terror. Uh, some of what we're doing, no question, resembles a traditional war. Uh, we are still bringing firepower to particular targets uh, to disrupt the enemy's ability to attack us. But so much of what we're doing now and what needs to be done resembles something much larger, uh, broader, different uh, than a military conflict. Uh, since 9-11, our military has been called upon to do extraordinary things. And I want to say that I think our military has performed spectacularly. Uh, the invasion of Afghanistan in particular was a monumental uh, victory, not just involving uh, US forces, as we all know. Uh, but today, we have two types of challenges. First, we have terrorist groups who are actively plotting against us, al-Qaeda leader, al -Qaeda leadership um, uh, along the Afghan-Pakistan border, as well as uh, the, the Zarqawi network in Iraq, for example. We're doing a pretty good job of closing in on that leadership and keeping them on the run. Uh, I know that, and I assume you do, too. And we're close to appre apprehending those uh, high-value targets we have not yet apprehended. However, there's the second challenge, which is the harder challenge, in my view, and that is the wider, radical Islamist movement that is inspired uh, by some of these folks. That movement is highly dispersed. It's loosely wired, horizontally connected, reinforced by the radical teachings in the madrasas and the mosques. Our military can do uh, pretty amazing things, and so can our intel community, by the way, along the afghan pak border, and, and even in Iraq. But it's like hammering jello. You can hit it as hard as you want, but then it just squirts out, that's a wonderful intel term, disperses, uh, as we saw in Fallujah. And then the network reconnects uh, somewhere else, in other locations, maybe even in other countries. And then that network grows and plugs into uh, a wider uh, and expanding jihadist movement. So now we have to <coughs> be concerned about terrorist affiliates in many other countries, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, Yemen, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, Jordan, uh, Palestinian territories and even Western Europe, 
Everyone gets that. Surely the Western European governments get that. Defeating this broader, wider threat will take much more than just our military. In a lot of these countries, we would never even consider, fortunately, taking military, uh, uni uh, unilateral military action. Uh, the key to preventing and disrupting terrorist attacks in many of these places is, as I said, good intelligence, and sometimes law enforcement, although mostly intelligence, much of which depends on our relationships uh, with intelligence and, and uh, political uh, networks in those countries. Diplomacy is key because we have to create the political will in these countries to fight terrorists with us and for us. And as the 9-11 Commission correctly pointed out, we also must have a broader public effort to win the hearts and minds of the Muslim world. That requires, as everybody gets, support for education, weaning these folks from these uh, jingoist madrasa uh, curricula, uh, economic development, support for human rights, etc. In sum, this war, if it is a war, is not going to end when we nab bin Laden or Zarqawi, which I certainly hope we will do. As long as there are millions of potential recruits, as long as terrorist groups can find safe haven, we are going to be living with this threat for the foreseeable future. It's an era of terror. And as far as I'm concerned, the question that Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld asked in an uh, internal memo that leaked a few years ago is still unanswered. That question was, are we creating more terrorists than we're eliminating? I don't think we yet know the answer to that question. My second point, the administration has a one-dimensional view about this so-called war on terror. And that one-dimensional view has resulted in a series of legal positions uh, and, and policy that now require serious rethinking. Uh, I would argue that uh, in the uh, immediate aftermath of 9-11, Congress did the right thing by passing the Patriot Act. I voted for it. This is an example. This is actually where Congress was involved, which has been rare. Um, uh, but at any rate, I would argue we did the right thing. Surely we could have done a better job, and hopefully we will do a better job uh, now that the Patriot Act is sunsetting in this year. I'm one of the supporters of the so-called SAFE Act, which I think is a bipartisan effort to improve the Patriot Act uh, by uh, refining some of the, uh, uh, I would say, um, uh, less uh, defensible provisions or indefensible provisions while continuing those provisions that are useful. But at any rate, uh, in the early days after 9-11, I think a, uh, a, a response that was perhaps uh, less subtle was justified. But we're no longer in the early days. We are, as everybody gets, three and a half years out. And so while the war paradigm might have been appropriate then, when our focus was on combat, uh, now it's not. Uh, one example of how it's not is how we, how we handle individuals uh, we detain. Um, just today in the Washington Post, uh, some of you may have seen, uh, there's a large article about a new position uh, that uh, the Defense Department is taking on detention, uh, which I think one could argue is an improvement in some ways and in other ways is just, uh, uh, you know, hardening, uh, the hardening of old positions. I haven't seen it, uh, but we have some of the details if you want to ask me about it uh, in a few minutes. Um, Jeremy has it on his little Blackberry, but, you know, the bottom line is there will be some effort to improve the chain of command by having detention uh, experts in local areas who can advise precisely on, on uh, what are proper detention uh, conditions. I think that's a good thing. Uh, it's also uh, a good thing that the, the, the so-called Miller Doctrine, developed by uh, former, or I guess he's President General Jeff Miller, the fellow who had been in charge of uh, Guantanamo, uh, has been junked. And that doctrine was that the um, uh, military police should uh, set the conditions uh, for interrogation. The military police will now have nothing to do with interrogations. They will only focus on uh, detentions. Those are good things. But the bad things are now there's a, an ever bigger
category, new category for en enemy combatants, uh, and it looks like an effort to disconnect a whole bunch of folks from the Geneva protections. So uh, we haven't read this thing, but it's out there, and at least it shows some effort by the administration, probably because of your conference, uh, to try to confront these issues a little better. Uh, you know uh, that uh, uh, the administration set up Guantanamo shortly after 9-11. Uh, I have visited it three times. The purpose of Gitmo, uh, I believe, was to create a prison that would be outside the jurisdiction of U.S. courts. Uh, in case you missed it, we rent uh, the Guantanamo space from, um, from Cuba and have done that in this kind of bizarre way uh, for, I think, about 70 years. Our check for $4,000 is put in Castro's desk and never cashed. I don't quite understand that, but in legal terms, it's not U.S. soil. Uh, as a temporary measure, um, you may be able to see the logic of Gitmo, but it's not, in my view, a permanent solution. Um, creating a group of uh, essentially, I can never know the Spanish word, desperacitos, desperacitos, uh, is, is inconsistent uh, with our Constitution and our values. And as the Supreme Court held in the Razul case, prisoners must have a legal status and the ability to challenge that status. I think that's just obvious. They must have a, uh, a legal status and the ability to challenge it. Uh, the administration also decided it could hold individuals such as uh, Jose Padilla without charges and without access to counsel on the theory that he was an enemy combatant entitled to no uh, legal rights, even though he was an American citizen detained at O'Hare Airport uh, that position is also inconsistent with our Constitution and our values, and I think it will not survive judicial review. And then, of course, we have the case of uh, the now famous legal memos, which I know you've been talking about, uh, basically suggesting, uh, my shorthand, that torture is permissible. Uh, these memos have largely been repudiated, uh, but only after the embarrassment uh, and the black eye of Abu Ghraib. As uh, Will Taft, um, my former law school classmate and the uh, recently uh, retired uh, legal advisor to the State Department pointed out recently how our government treats people should never be up to the whim of the policymaker. It must be a matter of law. And yet the administration clings to the view that our laws do not constrain the actions of the commander in chief in wartime. But in an era of terror, I think this position breaks down. Should we suspend our laws forever? Is that real, really what America wants to stand for? Uh, you know that the Geneva Conventions established a regime uh, whereby a country could hold POWs until the cessation of hostilities. But what if there is never a cessation? Can you hold someone indefinitely? The administration's answer is yes. I don't think so. There's also the issue of interrogations. Interrogations are vital tools. I support an aggressive interrogation program. Done right, they are a major source of intelligence to help prevent and disrupt the plots that could potentially kill millions of Americans. I'm pleased that, uh, you know, pick one, some of these high value targets are being detained and interrogated uh, by America. But our troops and intelligence officers have been forced to operate in what I have called in, in, uh, in, in other uh, venues the fog of law. The recently released report of Vice Admiral Church investigating interrogations policies at Gitmo in Iraq and Afghanistan demonstrated clearly that almost every theater had a different set of rules and every commander had different guidance and that the policies kept shifting. Uh, that is not helpful to yielding uh, good product from those being interrogated because those doing the work are very unsure how to do it. So what should we be for? For starters, everyone agrees, including the administration, that torture is absolutely prohibited. Engaging in torture undermines our moral authority. It harms our own troops, and it is not effective at eliciting useful intelligence. But the question is, what techniques short of torture are permissible? Under the Senate reservation to the Convention Against Torture, 
The U.S. cannot engage, uh, you all know this, in any cruel, inhuman, or degrading conduct that would violate the Fifth, Eighth, or Fourteenth Amendments to the Constitution. But what does that actually mean? What is CID, and how is it, how does one parse it with the, uh, the amendments to the Constitution? During his confirmation hearings, Alberto Gonzalez took the position that these uh, constitutional protections did not apply at all to foreigners abroad, and therefore we were free to engage in CID uh, if we detained foreigners abroad. Many of us were disturbed by this, and that is, I think, when I began uh, collaboration with old friends, uh, Phil Hyman and Juliet Kayyem at Harvard, who had already uh, been thinking carefully about this subject and written a relevant report on how we might craft legislation uh, to provide a process for accountability and oversight in interrogations. The thought was never to spell out, you know, can you do waterboarding or not? What exactly uh, can you do in terms of uh, food or sleep deprivation or noise or whatever, but to put a framework around decisions by the executive branch uh, in these areas so that there was full accountability and full oversight over whatever practices the administration, any administration, decided to <coughs> employ. Our, oper our operating premises were that, as I said earlier, clear rules empower interrogators. We want interrogators to do their best job. We want them to know what the limits are and to use the powers available to them effectively. Second, that the legal vacuum um, that exists today, this fog of law, will be filled by the courts, uh, which risks inconsistent rulings, and we're seeing that right now. Uh, I don't think we're better off by having uh, court decisions all over the place which provide uh, very unclear guidance and just feed this fog that I've talked about. Uh, another operating premise was, uh, as I said earlier too, that America has a black eye, and uh, these allegations of American misconduct uh, which continue to surface uh, in every newspaper every week, uh, I think risk uh, making the answer to Rumsfeld's question, yes. They feed the training schools and the recruiting schools for terrorists. They make us into an enemy, which uh, I profoundly hope uh, we are not. Uh, the search for a legislative solution, um, given these ideas, is ongoing. But I want to tell you uh, why we're stuck. First of all, uh, the administration is adamantly opposed to legislation that would define or restrict the president's ability to engage in treatment short of torture. They continue to argue that the president must have an unfettered ability as commander in chief to operate in wartime. And we've just been through all these arguments why I would say uh, an indefinite wartime is inconsistent with the American values. Uh, but on the other hand, the civil liberties community, uh, with which I admire and with whom I meet uh, regularly, worry that if we codify something, we're codifying a slippery slope. And that slippery slope will mean that whatever definitions we come up with will be interpreted broadly, and that will allow or, in fact, make legal uh, conduct which they continue to want to, uh, to uh, challenge in the courts. Well, again, my answer to them is um, I care about this very much. Uh, I really do. But I think we're already on that slippery slope, headed in the wrong direction. One suggestion that has been made is that we codify the rules uh, of the Army Field Manual on interrogations. Those are fairly well understood. Uh, I think it's an interesting idea, but the problem with it is that our enemy will train to the manual just as we train our own people to the manual and will train to resist those specific procedures which will make them uh, much less effective or some would argue totally ineffective. Uh, and at any rate, uh, many oppose this even without that because again, it's this slippery slope uh, that apparently will lead to more abuses. So bottom line, there's no agreement. Uh, I believe strongly that the status quo is confusing and has led to abuses, but there really is no agreement and no political will on how to fix the problem. 
which leads to my third point. I think it would be uh, very useful to convene a diverse group of smart people, uh, bipartisan, including administration officials and the civil liberties communities, to try to work out a consensus solution. I think that Congress should take the lead. Article 1, Section 8 provides that Congress shall make laws concerning captures on land and on water. This is our responsibility. This is not the role of the White House, any White House, not the role of the courts, any courts. This is the role of Congress. We actually have some good models to build on. Uh, Phil Hyman and Juliet Kayyem have uh, put forward a framework that we might use as a starting point. And in a different context, we can see the valuable work of the Markle Foundation uh, in helping us shape how we think about information sharing. There can be trusted networks. Information sharing does not automatically lead to Big Brother. Uh, this was a group of diverse people who wrestled this issue to the ground and really helped us structure uh, the information sharing uh, 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 portions of the um, uh, DNI legislation. Uh, I'm, I am persuaded by working with Markle uh, that we invented a concept that carefully, uh, I wouldn't even say balances, that, that, that carefully incorporates um, uh, the two goods of, of more security and the protection of privacy and civil liberty. This can happen. These are reinforcing values and the key to figuring this stuff out is to convene a diverse group of people and work hard and build a consensus. That's what Markle did, and that's what I, I really hope we can do here. Uh, as I said from the outset, we live in an era of terror. This threat will be, us, will be with us for the long term. We just can't act as if it's a temporary emergency, and that if we hit the target hard, harder, it will go away. We can't suspend our laws or put our values on hold. Lecturing the world about democratic values and then not adhering to them ourselves hurts our ability to get others to join the fight. I believe that an effective legal regime which allows us to go after the terrorist targets and allows us to be a role model for the world is key to our security in this new era. These are not mutually exclusive they are mutually reinforcing. And so I invite the smart people here at Duke and around the country who love our country, revere our Constitution, support our troops, and want to see us prevail to work together in establishing this dialogue to safeguard our nation and the values we're fighting for. Thank you very much. Congresswoman has agreed to take some questions. So once again, we have portable mics, which I don't see at the moment. Here's one. So right here in the middle. Uh, Could you identify mic. yourself? Sure. And, and wait for the, yeah, right. Wait for the mic. This is a Duke rule, right? <laughs> Hi, hello, Congresswoman. My name is Ben Davis. I'm a uh, professor at University of Toledo Law School. Uh, I, in Toledo, Ohio, as you know, Ohio is the center of the universe for the last elections, and Toledo is right at the center of that universe. The reason I'm, my question is the I following. Your vote was counted accurately. Uh, so I've been told. I, I was also a poll watcher. Uh, my point is, uh, my question is the following. You've served on the House Intelligence Committee. You've had over the last two and a half years. And also there's the Senate Intelligence, the House Arms, and Senate Arms. I find it hard to believe that in the closed sessions of those meetings, whether it was euphemistically said or not, that this whole torture policy was never discussed with any of you. I'm going to say this because the problem of legislative, or we call political branch responsibility and accountability, is, is one structural difficulty we have. You suggested a judicial sort of approach with a, new, uh, with a new legislation, but I was talking with Justice Ginsburg last week, and the problem for the just judges is simple. They don't have prosecutors who will enforce it. And of course, the prosecutors in our present situation are the Attorney General of the United States, one of the writers for the torture memos that we're talking about. So what I'm wondering about is if this is a long-term problem, a legislative solution 
with the possibility of political difficulties to actually do anything, we're, um, we're not going to have impeachments, um, is, is, is limited. But we still need to address high-level civilian criminal, potentially criminal behavior. One of the ideas that came to my mind was to have a U.S. domestic international criminal court where international criminal law violations, just like the Foreign Intelligence Court, would be subject to a domestic international criminal court of the United States with its prosecutor, with a special prosecutor, a permanent structure. That would be a check on people who would like to argue things that they continue to do, that they may suffer responsibilities with a prosecutor willing to act on it within the U.S. It would also, I'd argue, for our carve-outs for things like um, the ICC and for, for example, in the Security Council for Darfur, the carve out for U.S. citizens, it would assure that high level civilians would be under some kind of uh, potential risk of criminal responsibility because right now we never prosecute high level civilians. We'll do military commissions for low level folks. An example of that is the Cali case back in my line in Vietnam. Let me, let me encourage you to move to a question if there is. That's the question. Why about a high, a high level international criminal well, court? There, you have a lot of stuff in there, so let me, let me try a few things. The answer is, I learned about the White House memos in the newspaper the same way you did. Uh, I then got hold of some of those White House memos, but congressional oversight has been totally ineffective uh, over these uh, issues. And uh, I'm calling on Congress to act because I think it's our constitutional responsibility. Uh, and I think by setting up a proper framework which would include accountability, we would get a lot farther. That's my first answer to you. Secondly, you did ask about accountability for civilians. Uh, I think they should be accountable. Uh, you're right that the military system is doing a you know, pretty reasonable job of prosecuting some of its folks. Most of them seem to be in the middle and lower ranks. What about uh, more high-level military folks? Well, I don't, I don't yet think it's over. Uh, and I think anyone who was responsible ought to be accountable. I don't disagree with that. On the civilian side, uh, some would argue, and Ohio was in the middle of this, <coughs> that the election last November was the accountability moment uh, for this president, who, after all, appoints his cabinet, one, of, one member of whom is uh, Don Rumsfeld. And a lot of this material was out there in the election, and uh, voters decided to keep uh, the Bush administration in office. So that was, that is a way, not the only way, that we hold uh, uh, political elected leadership accountable. And they passed. That's, that's certainly how they're behaving. Uh, and they did pass. I mean, you know, unless we want to argue that Ohio should be, uh, the Ohio political result was wrong, and some are still arguing that. So uh, now what? Uh, I do think that. Uh, we need uh, to work, continue to work on accountability for past conduct. Uh, I think the best way to do it is to insist that some of these reviews that Congress has, re has required, such as the accountability review of, by the IGs of every intelligence agency for conduct le leading up to 9-11, uh, which these reviews are supposed to name names in these agencies, be completed. Lots of those names will be civilians, and then we see where that goes. Uh, but. Uh, I, I guess I'm cool to this notion of a domestic uh, ICC since the international ICC, um, at least in, in the present climate, is not getting uh, much support. I think we would get nowhere with a domestic ICC. I think we can do it another way, but bottom line, I support accountability and I support new, a new framework that will build in accountability so it would be easier uh, both for people to know what to do and then if they do it wrong, um, to uh, hold them accountable for it. Okay. I'll ask a much shorter question. This probably, is Warren Wickersham. Right, probably hi, because Warren. Of, hi, hi, Jake. Uh, because I'm not a constitutional lawyer, and I may not understand the issue, but there's been a lot of discussion about uh, who should be setting the parameters of this, the Congress or the mm -hmm. President. Uh, has there been consideration to something short of the comprehensive uh, uh, limitations on interrogation techniques, such as if Congress saying that these laws or the Geneva Convention or other laws should apply to uh, all uh, people in the United States and all foreigners uh, in, in certain jurisdictions. Could we say that our executive is bound by the Geneva Convention or other rules and would that be uh, something that the Congress could agree on or not? Well, we actually did some of that 
uh, in the last Congress, and I'm trying to e exactly remember the piece we left out, but during the consideration, and I'm going to ask Jeremy to answer that, during the consideration of the DNI legislation, everybody knows what I mean by that, the, the Intel Reform Bill, uh, to set up a director of national intelligence, um, there was a provision in the Senate version that said Geneva shall apply, I think, to uh, all detentions and interrogations <coughs> by anybody. Um, and we dropped it, and so a bunch of folks got all upset. The reason we dropped it was uh, we believed that uh, adequate language already with respect to detentions and interrogations by uh, the military was in the defense authorization bill, and we decided we would look at a harder topic, and it is, it's just different, it's harder. Detentions by, uh, what do we call them, NG, NG? OGAs, other government agencies, the, use, the euphemism for the CIA. Uh, we would look at that in the, in the Intel authorization bill this year. It then turned out that the defense language was not as tight as we had thought, if I remember this right. So I still think that's an idea that needs to be explored. The trouble with Geneva, uh, and I, you know, don't let me defend these White House memos because I don't, but the trouble with Geneva is it applies to a set of circumstances that are often irrelevant to the modern terrorist era, the modern era of terror. Uh, there isn't really a battlefield with two armies. There aren't state actors. And so in that sense, uh, treating people humanely, which is kind of bottom line of Geneva, is something we should apply. But just maybe we should think through carefully uh, whether Geneva ought to be modified, I actually think that suggestion of Alberto Gonzalez is worth considering, or whether we ought to have uh, a better framework, I mean a framework more, more geared to these threats. Did I get that right? You did, boss, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just going to add one thing, which is Senator Durbin had a proposal last year, and which I think continues, which would ban cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment uh, for everybody. It's a, it's a flat ban, and that's a a good-hearted proposal that, that, that is in the right direction. But then when you read the definitions section of it, it says we define cruel and human and degrading as that which would violate the Fifth, Eighth, and Fourteenth Amendments. And so it's circular. It goes back to the same gap in the law that the Congresswoman talked about that Gonzalez exposed when he testified and said that these constitutional protections do not apply to foreigners abroad. And this is a dialogue we've been having with several uh, human rights groups and with the Durban office and others. And there are uh, proposals to fix this and to close the gap and to close the loophole, and that's one of the things that we've been exploring. Let's come down here. Thank you. Thank this you. This is a family business with this microphone. <laughs> I just figured this out. Uh, thank you, Congressman. I have a two-part question. The first is uh, you raised it in your remarks. Uh, do you think we require reform in covert actions? Are you happy the way the 1947 National Security Act has set up the procedures? And B, where do you stand on um, an MI6 for the United States, the reform of the FBI, oh, MI5, MI5? MI5 for yeah. the United States? Okay. Where do you stand on that issue and if that changes? Those well, I think, again, talk about the fog of law. I think we're, you know, I'm reading in the, I read in the newspapers first, and I've sub subsequently learned a bit about the, the clandestine activities of the Defense Department short of covert actions, which is a very sp clearly spelled out program, at least with respect to obligations to notify Congress, the covert action program of the CIA. Uh, I think uh, the notion that we could be doing things in, in, in different agencies differently uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. And yes, of course, we should always be reviewing uh, programs. Uh, but do I support covert activity properly drawn? Yes, I do. Um, you asked me about um, how did I vote on, 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 or what is my view on an MI5? Well, I, you know, having, having been to England, I mean, actually I had an interesting experience once. I was in England visiting with the head of England's MI5, which is, as you know, they're, they're totally separated uh, domestic spy service. Uh, I asked her, the last head of it was a woman, um, well, you know, do you think we ought to have MI5 in our country? And, and uh, uh, her response was, well, actually, I like the way you do joint terrorism task forces, and I'm wondering whether we ought to scrap MI5 and move the JTTF concept to England. Uh, but England is different. It's an island. It has two million people, all of whom know each other. 
everybody in the law enforcement business is related and trained together. So, um, uh, I just I I think it is a, a, an environment that doesn't apply here. I was hopeful that the reorganization of the FBI that Bob Mueller has already undertaken, setting up an intelligence service, but not totally segregated uh, inside the FBI would be satisfactory. I've been supporting that. However, I just read the WMD Commission report last week, and they're unsatisfied with it. And they're saying, uh, Larry Silverman told me this two days ago, either they're going to have an MI5 inside the FBI or outside. Um, I think we have to look at it. Um, I'm hoping we don't go that direction because I don't think the traditions fit, but uh, certainly we, def we absolutely want an effective intelligence capability inside the U.S., and that intelligence capability has to be tightly coordinated uh, by the DNI and has to meet uh, constitutional and uh, uh, other uh, uh, restrictions. Now, uh, the Congresswoman and I agreed that I'd call on people so that when I had to stop and some people didn't get answered, they'd be mad at me and not at her. <laughs> but let me shift some of this to Scott, too, and ask him, how long can we go? Let's go for another five minutes, first. Okay. okay. All right. Then in the back. Uh-oh. I'm, I'm, I didn't realize that, Scott. <laughs> yep. Congresswoman, uh, my name is Brittany Benoist. I'm with the Center for National Security Studies. I wanted to thank you for your comments and also say what a privilege it's been to here, as you said, one of the big four talk about what was really going on in, during the conference report and uh, to know that we had an advocate for the rule of law in that room. Um, my question is actually related and it has to do with the fog of law concerning the techniques that can be used by the intelligence community within the United States. The, those techniques that which have historically been some of the questions that raised the hardest questions for civil liberties in the United States are governed by, as you know, Attorney General guidelines, DCI directives, uh, memorandums of understanding, and other you know, provisions that come out of the executive branch that are often classified and subject to amendment at any time. And I think that part of what we've learned from the WMD Commission is that uh, in addition to the turf battle that we can anticipate coming out of Intel reform with regards to the relationship between the DNI and the Secretary of Defense, there's a lot of turf battles going on about who's going to play what role within the United States. Mm -hmm. My question is, is it time for us to think about whether a system of regulations that are classified and subject to amendment are sufficient to protect civil liberties in an age when domestic intelligence, no matter where it's going to take place, is growing? Well, it's a hard, guess what, hard question. Uh, surely uh, we don't want to carve out the domestic United States from this network of folks who are carefully trying to find the bad guys and prevent them from harming us. Uh, that would be called, by my lights, a giant loophole. And if I were, you know, pick any of these networks, I would go find me some local homegrown products in the United States, which I think they're trying to do anyway, uh, which is why I think uh, all this railing about uh, illegal immigrants or all, you know, all the terrorists will come from the Ill illegal immigrant ranks is, is foolish. Uh, I think it's very possible to grow the Timothy McVeighs of the future and link them to international terrorist networks. Um, and uh, no amount of border protection is going to prevent that. But at any rate, um, yes, we have to carefully think through and rethink all the time, I think, the practices <coughs> that, that, that we follow, uh, the procedures that we follow against um, Americans in America. Uh, I, I guess my, my sort of bottom line answer there uh, is yes. I talked about Jose Padilla. I mean, we're already detaining and disappearing, you know, some Americans. Uh, but I, and I think that that's wrong. Uh, but uh, I don't know what the right answer is. I don't think you want um, everything that is now classified or covert to be a matter of public record, even though you want and I want to make sure we're protecting civil liberties. I don't want to tip off the bad guys. I want to have procedures that we all consider to be fair, but I want to be hard-nosed about this. I want to understand, as I think I do, um, as uh, um, you know, was mentioned, I was a member of this uh, Commission on Terrorism that, that wrote a pretty hard-headed report before 9-11. They're here, and they don't want to sit, sit at the table. They want to blow up the table, and I don't want them to blow up the table. So um, it is it is a a tough uh, 
uh, uh, project, but there are reinforcing values of protecting security and protecting civil liberties. And I want us to come together and just get it right and not take things off the table that could uh, save innocent American lives. Uh, Professor Chesney, last, last question. You have to talk into the mic or you I can. broke the rule, I'm sorry. Bobby Chesney from Wake Forest. First of all, thank you both for being here. We're, we're really honored to have you here. Harvey asked a moment ago about covert operations, and um, I wanted to follow up briefly on that. The congressional reporting requirement for covert operations, of course, contains the traditional military activities exception, which in turn includes preparation of the battlefield. And to quote you from a moment ago, there isn't really a battlefield, or at least post-operation and during well, there the is, but there isn't a battlefield everywhere. Uh -huh. Exactly. And so I'm wondering whether there's any talk or if you're considering um, the need to possibly amend the exception in a way that will deal with the possibility that this exception could grow to swallow the rule. Um, did you, uh, I, I think the answer to that, at least at the moment, is no. But I, I do think uh, that we have to more closely align, as I said, covert action and clandestine action programs. and. Uh, I have been impressed. We, we went to uh, uh, SOCOM recently, the Special Operations Command in Florida, and, and uh, Jeremy went on to see actually how we train our special ops forces. And, and these are thoughtful people, and they're all thinking about how to make this work better. I don't know that uh, I want to slow down true battlefield operations. I do understand what that exception is supposed to do. If it's being abused, yeah, I want to weigh in. But I'm not sure I want to have no flexibility for battlefield commanders in extreme necessity. Um, you know, they, if they have to run back and tell Jane, I don't, I, somehow there's some, something about that uh, it, it, ahead of the fact uh, that, that strikes me as wrong. Um, We're just going to add one thought, which is in the 1947 National Security Act, there are two things. One, it relates to covert action authorities, but then there's sort of an overarching rule that says that every agency, including DOD, must keep Congress currently and fully informed of yeah. all intelligence activities. So we are demanding that, and we've been in a dialogue with relevant agencies that are requiring them to report to us on a regular basis all of their intelligence activities, but, covert or not. But that, again, a lot of that's after action. We're not, I mean, I, I, I am sensitive, and I hope you're all sensitive to the timing of all this. Uh, we want to set up the right procedures. We want there to be full accountability. But it is a darn dangerous world, folks, and uh, there are some very, very evil people out there. I see a lot of you nodding. Um, the goal is to prevent those people from harming us and then not to grow any more people like them. And getting these policies right is very tricky. Military force will not do it alone. Absolutely not. Uh, the squirting out problem is, 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 is a real one. It will require extremely, extremely uh, uh, <coughs> careful thinking about how to, how, how to set up what I call the, the, the reinforcing values and, and revisiting of this uh, every period. Uh, hopefully, if we get the Patriot Act right this year, that will be one good example. Uh, it won't fix everything, but one good example of how we could do course correction in a dangerous world. And I'm trying to work on that as well as I can. And the, the good news, in a highly polarized uh, political environment in Congress is that the sponsorship of the SAFE Act, which I'm sure is not perfect either, uh, but the sponsorship of the SAFE Act is bipartisan. Uh, folks on the, on the right end of the spectrum and the left end of the spectrum and kind of the middle, I'd put me in the middle, are all co-sponsoring this thing. Uh, the ACLU is in there and the, I don't know, Bob Barr and uh, Jeff Flake and, uh, and I don't know if the, uh, some of the other Gun owners of America. Gun owners right. of America. Well, now, <laughs> it's got to pass then, right? Uh, they're all in there. So, um, it, you know, it may be called the unholy alliance, but it's pretty interesting <laughs> that this is happening. And if we can do that, then just maybe we can take on a number of these other hard issues and get them right. But I, I just, I just want to close with this. I think that was the last question, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is, um, the world is dangerous. And much as we would like to think that uh, uh, we're back, uh, some, I don't know that I would like to think this, but much as some folks would like to think that we can go back to a safer era, I think we cannot go backwards. We're going forward to something different. The threats are, in my view, more dangerous than they were in the Cold War. We don't have a 
identifiable, rational enemy whom we can uh, train against. We have unidentifiable, irrational enemies in this loosely affiliated alliance among them across the world, including inside America. And figuring out how to, how to do this right, consistent with our values, is an absolutely huge challenge and one that Congress cannot shirk. Thank you very much.